Good morning again. It's great to be here in Houston. What's interesting to me as someone that only gets to come here every few years is when I come back and I, I look back at some of the earlier presentations that I've given and I've shown these kinds of images in the past, I'm always intrigued at the role that landscape and cityscape play in how a city presents itself, um, even during an era when in fact landscape was really not being put first. There is a movement today and we are excited to be able to broadcast and share with a larger populace the enthusiasm for what's happening in Houston right now, and hence this second conference in our series. I had some fun pulling out some quotes. I couldn't um, resist Mimi's um, in terms of recognizing the development potential in all of this work as well. I think it's interesting in the remarks that we began with where we're looking at the public-private partnerships, but we're also um, quietly recognizing that uh, development goes hand in glove, not just today, but historically, whether it was Comey or the Olmsteads. Uh, this is what drove the work. But what's, what's interesting for about probably half the audience that's coming here from throughout North America is that we all have um, perceptions of Houston, built on private interests, light-handed, being polite, planning, offering a paucity of development opportunities, inchoate community, little available public space. I think we're going to be busting that myth today and suburban neighborhoods which serve as pass-through settlements. These are not my words, these are words of others that I have read in describing Houston, mostly in the 70s and 80s, during this period, period of Houstonization. I think it's interesting today that there's a movement to actually take back this term. And if you Google Houstonization, you find several thousand examples. You'll find folks from Kinder Institute and other places talking about what it means today. And it's interesting that I was able to find my first reference was 1975 in, of all places, The New Yorker, talking about Houstonization. So are we today looking at what the next chapter of Houstonization looks like? But here's the reality. Low lying. Anyone that's flown in in the last few days knows firsthand. I thought it was some of the most exciting turbulence I've had in quite some time. <laughs> There's something kind of magical when you hear the wheels coming down and you don't see the ground and then you're there. <laughs> wow. But you know, um, it is this drama uh, that people live with here every day. So how do we deal with that? And yet, we forget. We forget that Houston owes its growth to its location on the arm of the Gulf of Mexico, Buffalo Bayou. We forget that at the early 20th century, Houston was an exporting center for cotton, rice, wheat, and the development of trade along the bayou. And we forget about the advent of the railroad caused Houston to become a railroad as well as a shipping center. And you know, it's always interesting when you look at some of the park plans that happen, not just here in Texas with Kessler and in Dallas and El Paso, but other parts of the country, there is obviously a direct connectivity between the civic gestures that flowed out of the City Beautiful era and the railroad that enabled city shaping at that time. So what I'm gonna do now is give you kind of the Monarch Notes version, even smaller, of the shaping of the city. Now, what I was fascinated with, as someone who comes from the Northeast, who grew up in New York, where you had parks that went back to the 1860s, is that the first parks in Houston, lo and behold, were privately funded. Coombs Park, for example, which is also known as Forest Park, was a former amusement park. There are many celebrated images of the former natatorium, if you Google. And after this, of course, we have, like in a lot of American cities, a great rural cemetery, where people went for passive enjoyment to interpret art and nature. And here, of course, it's uh, Glenwood Cemetery. Emancipation Park, created and built for people of color. And then we have Highland Park, today known as Woodland Park. And what I find interesting here is just this gesture of promenading, whether it's Park Monceau or Central or Prospect Park. That before the advent of public parks, people were still using parks in a way that they were in sort of American and European precedents. Now, nested into this in 1899 is the first municipal park, today known as Sam Houston Park. What's so interesting to me about these images, is they're all taken within about a 12-year period. This is an expression we would use today about parks that are being loved to death. I mean, it just says that at this time in Houston, there is a thirst for public space. I mean, to look at these images and see Beaux-Arts, City Beautiful, 
picturesque, naturalistic features all crammed into 19 acres, all within a short period of time says, people are hungry and ready for parks. So what does and did that look like if we're going to lead with landscape? And I'll come back to this question again later. So first, let's just look at a historic perspective. Remarkable to me that around 1910, and I should say that these stats come out of a meeting of the American Planning Association for a conference they were having in Dallas at that time. Houston had a population of 79,000 people. So 79,000 people live here, and along comes Mr. Comey with his vision. And what does Comey do? He proposes an interconnected collection of, of parks and public spaces. And the other thing that's interesting here is his client is the Houston Parks Commission. There is no planning department at this time. In a way that we talked about PPP earlier, I'm gonna sort of put a spin on that and talk about my sort of trio, which is the theme of the change over time here. And that is the role of the bureaucratic patron, the role of the civic patron, and the role that the landscape architect plays helping those individuals realize their vision. Per Joe's comments, making sketches and then building them. And at this time, the big booster was Horace Baldwin Rice, who was on a great roll until Gusher H. Game changer. Buffalo Bayou is widened to 150 feet, a channel depth of 25 feet. All of this happens with no adopted plan at this time. Now the other thing I wanted to just sort of make a side reference to that I'm intri intrigued with as we think about education today and we talk about building a big tent to promote the ideas that we're talking about is that we tend to look at these images of this time of people using the rivers for recreation and enjoying a spiritual contact with nature. We don't think about the scientific quest in a place that has a university front and center and how this played out historically at Rice and how it's also even playing out today with the University of Houston in downtown. I was particularly taken by this quote by Bill Flores in a re recent article where he highlights the importance of giving back to the communities where we live and where we work, and this is all happening through the scientific investigation of one's contact with nature. No different than a century ago. So here's how I'd like to set up this morning's discussion. Chapter one, which I've just touched on, Park and Parkway Network, Houston comes late to the game, only partially realizes its vision. This is movement for pleasure. Second phase, the freeway, movement for efficiency, utilitarian travel by automobile, great speeds, relief from congestion. Then where we are today, which our panels will be looking at, is what I call the landscape architecture hybrid, the freedom of balanced movement at all scales to an interconnected network for urban and suburban landscapes. So let me start with the first phase. So in October of 22, the Planning Commission was established by Mayor Holcomb, and this is a name we're gonna see again and again. During this time, we had a major street plan, a civic center, plans for parkways along the bayou, and um, an initial quest for zoning. This drawing in particular is really fascinating, I think, when you look back to this now a century ago. These are the proposed cross-sections. These are the same kind of cross-sections you'd see in an Olmsted plan of this period. Notice the one on the top right. It's interesting because it's only taken 100 years, but I would say that this is design workshop. You guys are using a little crib sheet here from Comey. <laughs> this is Post Oak Boulevard. The only difference here is four feet. This is the same cross-section, of course, using the technology that we have available today. But the hand of the landscape architect is something that has been proposed here for a century. It's just taken us a little while to get there. <laughs> now, if we're going to talk about these places, and we have already seen the planet alignment under the park's leadership and the mayoral leadership in recent years, this was no different historically. And here it was three individuals. First, Mayor Holcomb. This is astonishing to me, 11 non-consecutive terms, 22 to 57. Will Hogg, the great civic patron, and Herbert Hare, and here again, what's remarkable, 1923 to 1960, serving as the city's official planning consultant. Now, about a decade before planning comes about, we have Houston's first Parks Commission and the gift of parkland by George Herman. Here are just some samples of those plans, including the work of Kessler and Hare and Hare. We'll hear more about these in the presentations later today. And then, of course, Hogg gets to serve as the first chairman of the commission, which is reestablished with serious intentions in 1927. That's phase one. Then we have phase two, the freeway. 
This is the proposed freeways in 1942 in Houston. We talk about people who have shaped the American landscape and our pioneers programs at the Cultural Landscape Foundation. I have to confess that before we began this process, I had never heard of William James Van London, who was the engineer and manager behind the Houston freeways, he was also the person credited with creating the feeder street network. Now this to me is the important takeaway in Tom Watson's recent essay about him. Quote, while Van London had the authority and design skills and Holcomb provided necessary political support, the early freeway system could not have been constructed had it not been for a supportive population. History is repeating itself today. The vision and the values have shifted. Here it is for the ribbon cutting. It was the longest toll-free superhighway in the US. Mayor Holcomb was very smart. He had the foresight to recognize that the acquisition of the right-of-way for the Galveston Houston Electric Railway Company in 39 would provide the perfect forum. And this is a bit of trivia. Under Holcomb's watch, Houston became the first U.S. city also for sequential traffic lights and parking meters. Let's hear it for the parking meters. <laughs> now, the resulting traffic congestion created popular and sustained support for the freeway projects and for Holcomb himself. And no surprise, I'm sure for the locals, you're aware of the statistic. For me, when I learned this, it kind of knocked me out of my chair. Three quarters of Houston has been built since 1945. We can thank the freeways in Van London and Holcomb. Now, here's some interesting statistics. Two years after the freeway opened, 100,000 vehicle miles were traveled. The first traffic counts, 28,000 cars. Two years later, 62,500 cars. 82, 150,000 cars. In 2012, it was 245,000. What's interesting, it was down from a peak of 269,500 in 2001. Unlike the Katy Freeway, whose average daily traffic has gone from 238,000 in 2001 to 268,009 to 360,000 in 2012. So, what's next? Now, I just want to have a nod here because we're not going to be going in depth with many of these other projects that happen in the museum districts, but I thought this was a quote worth visiting in this time frame of building out the highways into the 60s and 70s. In a city devoid of zoning, this does not precisely constitute de facto zoning, but it certainly has resulted in a clearly identifiable zone. So before I talk about the leading with landscape panels and the work, I just want to mention a prelude. If we think about the freeways being a symbol of modernity in the 40s onward. If we think about the great architecture, the Houston collection, if you will, that started in the 70s, I would argue that the current phase is being driven by landscape architecture. So what we're seeing here is modernity being driven or modernism by first engineers and architects, and today landscape architects. Let me elaborate. Regarding the Katy Freeway, this was in the Atlantic City Lab just last month, the current mayor said, these types of projects are not creating the kind of vibrant, economically strong cities that we all desire. Now, I'm a native New Yorker. You know, for me, Ada Louise Huxtable was oxygen growing up. And, um, you know, have you kicked a building lately? If you haven't read it, classic. During the bicentennial, Ada Louise writes about the Pennzoil building. Houston is the place where money, power, and patronage are coming together in a city of singular excitement and significance in the 70s. She concludes, if Houston has found the formula for turning prosperity and growth into beauty and elegance, it is indeed the city of the future. You could write that today. And it gave rise to the Houston collection. And we know these people. All I have to do is say Philip, Renzo, Mies, Caesar. You know who I'm talking about. But what we shouldn't forget, again, are three players. In this case, it is, of course, Gerald Hines. Gerald Hines, quoting Ari Scardino, executive director of the AIA, said, architecturally, Houston would be pretty poverty-stricken without him. This is, in fact, the Houston collection. Now, what's also interesting to me, and I didn't know this until I saw an interview recently, is that Tom Bacon, who's been such a great supporter for all this work, prior to founding Lionstone in 2001, he worked for Hines. And I think what's interesting here is that with the public-private partnerships that we're seeing today, that the kind of civic patronage that we've seen is we're moving from building objects to systems and to landscapes. 
They can also serve as, for those of you not from Houston, serves as chairman of the Houston Parks Board, whose mission is to create, preserve, and advocate for parkland. And astonishingly, the organization has added 14,000 acres of parkland. So I don't know if everyone here saw Mimi Swartz's um, extended uh, piece in Ten Texas Monthly a few months ago, but she's having a conversation with Bacon. And Bacon asks her, what's your picture of Houston? And she says, I had to think a moment, then I got it. A map of the city with all the freeways, I answered. But what if your picture of Houston was this? A series of narrow rivers flowing in a larger body of water, he says. And he concludes, that's Houston, green infrastructure instead of gray infrastructure. I don't know about the other landscape architects, but I got goose pimples <laughs> when I read that. <laughs> he concludes, though, by saying, that kind of notion could have gotten a person committed here 20 years ago. I didn't actually know that Ben Carson's announcement, speaking of crazy, would coincide uh, with this morning's presentation, but thanks for keeping me relevant, Ben. And again, let's go back to that earlier statement. As with the early freeway system, today's park renaissance could not have been constructed had it not been for a supportive population. So is this where we are today? Is this the new Houston collection? And that's what we're going to explore. Our first panel will be looking at all of these projects. And just very quickly, the projects um, as part of the first panel will include Kimball Museum architect Lou Kahn and the landscape architect Harriet Pattison working on the Dominion campus. I was unaware of these earlier plans. We've just completed an oral history with Harriet Pattison. And I wanted to show this. I'm, I'm not going to read the quote on the screen, but what's so interesting to me about this work is when this work is done, we're saying it's okay to be a pedestrian. It's okay to go into a neighborhood and not tear down the houses. It's okay to work with the bone structure of a place, and it's okay to get out of your car. And so for me, this idea of what was already happening on the great civic campuses here in Houston was being translated to a broader public realm. The other thing that's interesting to me about this is you think about the kind of sheds and, and centers of cultural energy that are created in communities today. According to an essay by Simone Swan, she was then the executive vice president for the Dominion Foundation, notes, a community bulletin board or marquee was one means under consideration to inform neighbors and invite them to attend their scheduled or impromptu events and exhibitions. We have to realize that today, there is so much information readily available. If you're in whatever population, whatever silo you're interested in the landscape, there's a social media community there to greet you. And so in a way that the Dominion was trying to say, let's reach out to the community, I believe that the kind of civic engagement we have today has been magnified because of the potential we have through social media. My favorite quote also in Mimi Swartz she opens with is referring to the former mud hole at Herman Park. I remember seeing the before. I remember hearing about the work that Lori was doing. And I think the important thing that I just want to say here about Olin's work early on is it also taught people what a landscape architect is, what a landscape architect does, and how to have big civic vision and ideas, and then the patronage muscle to pull it off. This was the game changer, and it's why it's part of the first panel in um, establishing the necessary foundations. Building on the public-private partnerships that we saw there came Discovery Green, and we'll have Mary Margaret Jones presenting this work. The park was envisioned by Houston philanthropists who saw the land as a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to create an urban park that would redefine the landscape of downtown, and it is known internationally. Buffalo Bayou in a recent conversation with Scott McCready noted was well-loved and well-used, and SWA's role was to amplify what was already there. So again, working within the bone structure of a place, and then looking ahead. The second panel, Engines for Revitalization, Levy Park, through the form foundation of another public-private partnership, the transformation of a forgotten 11-acre site into the centerpiece of a district began to take form, and we'll have the office of James Burnett presenting this. Reed Hildebrand and Design Workshop visiting the Arboretum, the succession of extreme droughts and floods affecting Houston over the past decade are evidence here of the region's changing climate. At 155 acres, the Houston Arboretum and Nature Center aims to reconcile a community's desire to restore what they've lost with the reality of ecological systems in flux with a plan predicated on exhaustive research. 
Southwest State's master plan for the Houston Botanical Garden aims to transform a 120 acre golf course just eight miles from the downtown into a center for scientific research and a cultural destination for Houstonians and visitors alike. And then finally, Thomas Woltz, Knitting Back Together Nature and Culture, Memorial Park is a landscape rich in ecological and cultural history that has been invisible, untended, and at times forgotten over the past century. It's twice the size of Central Park nearly. Memorial Park offers a remarkable opportunity to reset the distinct ecosystems of the park disrupted by transit infrastructure, invasive plants, and six years of drought and flood. Where else can you see four projects of such ambition simultaneously being talked about right now in the US. Now let's investigate what the planet alignment looks like if we aspire to lead with landscape. But first, a few words about the panels. We ask each speaker to address the following four themes in their presentations. One, the role that nature and culture play in forming design and stewardship decisions. This can range from earlier designs by notable landscape architects and planners to climate events and invasive species. Second, the idea of connectivity, natural systems, cultural lifeways, transportation, watershed, migratory patterns. Three, enabling, leveraging, and nurturing public-private partnerships, how to communicate, how to collaborate. And fourth, how do you measure success in your own work, and how does it stack up here in Houston? I leave you with these images. I think we do have planet alignment that is unrivaled here to lead with landscape, and I think we have the perfect trio that has been in place to advance this with a civic bureaucratic patron, the philanthropic patronage, and the landscape architects who will be presenting today. I thank all of you for coming, and I'd now like to turn this over to our first panel and Stephen Fox, our moderator.